Do you ever wonder why at the height of his popularity in the 90s, Sega never made a movie of Sonic the Hedgehog? Despite a few teething issues, uh... Sonic the Hedgehog finally ran full speed onto the big screen in 2020, bringing back with him nearly $320 million at the box office. Perhaps even more impressive, Sonic the Hedgehog was the third biggest movie in North America that year. Yeah, sure, there was a big gap in the 2020 release schedule for reasons, but the history books will show that Sonic the Hedgehog made more money at the box office than Tenet. When you think about it, Sonic greater than Christopher Nolan. Two years later and off the success of the first movie's performance, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 made more than its predecessor, with nearly $400 million at the box office, more than Disney's Lightyear, and more than video game movie adaptation Uncharted. It also leaned more into its video game heritage, essentially being a big screen version of Sonic 2 and Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Robotnik manipulating Knuckles against Sonic Tails as a tornado biplane, Chaos Emeralds, Super Sonic, spoilers, and even the Death Egg robot as part of the film's climax. Kids loved it because it was a bright, colorful adventure with a fun character, while their parents enjoyed it because it was basically their childhoods on screen. And the adventures are set to continue as Sonic the Hedgehog 3 will hit screens next year. With the success of the movies, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the Sonic the Hedgehog brand is at the apex of its popularity when really isn't the case. Sonic Frontier's got many positive write-ups when released in November 2022, but it's the first Sonic game to do so since Sonic Mania in 2017. And outside of Sonic Generations in 2011 that got favorable reviews, to find the best reviewed Sonic game before Sonic Mania, you have to travel back to the early 2000s. His comic book series sells well amongst fans, but the mainstream audience really aren't that interested in this little blue hedgehog. It raises questions of why Sega didn't make a movie based on Sonic when the character truly was at the height of his powers, when studies showed that he was a more recognizable figure than Mickey Mouse or even Michael Jackson. But what if I told you they nearly did? That Sega were in deep discussions to make a live action movie based on Sonic the Hedgehog in the mid 90s that would have coincided with the release of a brand new video game for the Sega Saturn. But an underlying fear of failure meant that it was never gonna see the light of day. Welcome to Cutscene, and this is why Sonic didn't get a movie 30 years ago. The late 1980s were not a great time for Sega, who played a distant second in the video game market behind the giant of Nintendo and their NES. The decision was made that rather than try to fight an 8-bit war with their 8-bit Master System, they would up the ante with their 16-bit Sega Mega Drive, which would be renamed to the Genesis in North America. Released in 1989, Sega of Japan wanted Sega of America to sell 1 million units in its first year. They managed half of that. The fortunes of the Genesis were turned around, however, when Tom Kalinske replaced Michael Katz as the president of Sega of America. Kalinske came in from Mattel, where he'd been instrumental in not only revitalizing the Barbie and Hot Wheels brands, but also the hugely successful He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Kalinske new brand, and he knew what consumers in America wanted. So when he was presented with a teal-colored hedgehog called Mr. Needlemouse, he might have found the answer to bolstering sales of the Genesis. Once they'd redesigned him, of course. Sega of America toned down some of Mr. Needlemouse's harsher edges, like his spiky exterior and sharp fangs, as well as his rock band backup and busty girlfriend named Madonna. They for a lack of a better term, westernized the design to appeal to American consumers and renamed him Sonic the Hedgehog. Kalinske then wanted to package this game, the hottest game that Sega would have released in 1991, but free with Genesis machines. Sega of Japan reluctantly agreed, but the plan worked. Sonic the Hedgehog was a smash hit, and even though Nintendo released the Super Nintendo just a few months later with the hotly anticipated Super Mario World, the Genesis outsold the SNES in almost every store across the country. In the holiday season of 1991, Sega outsold Nintendo 
two to one, giving them 65% of the market share. For the first time since 1985, Nintendo were not the number one video game system for Christmas. Sonic went from strength to strength with a slew of follow-up games like Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles, Sonic CD, and even a pinball spin-off game, Sonic Spinball. Maybe there was more than just the video game world, that Sonic could conquer. In 1992, Michaeline Risley was brought in as Sega of America's Director of Entertainment and Consumer Products by its Executive Vice President Shinobu Toyoda. Initially, her job was to steer their newly signed deal with ABC to produce two animated shows based on Sonic the Hedgehog. Kalinske learned how instrumental the launch of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe cartoon series was to the success of the toy line, and he wanted to replicate that with Sonic and his games for the Sega Genesis and Sega Mega Drive. We approached ABC with the idea of doing two shows based on Sonic, so we had a syndicated show for the after-school audience, which I think we did around 65 episodes for, and a more edgier one that aired on Saturday mornings. The syndicated show was titled The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, and certainly attempted to capture the fast-paced nature of the video games and the manic energy of its leading character. But it isn't as fondly remembered by fans as the much darker Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic! Known to fans as Sat AM because it aired on Saturday mornings, Sonic the Hedgehog is still beloved to this day, even though the show was toned down somewhat in its second season at the request of ABC. Sat AM was cancelled in 1994 after two seasons, and although both shows only had a short shelf life outside of syndication, they did for the brand exactly what Sega of America wanted them to do. According to Michaeline Risley, the shows turned Sonic merchandising into a billion dollar business. Sonic had conquered the video game industry. He was a hit in the comics world and a smash on the small screen. He even had a single released in the UK in 1992. There was only one natural next step. Remember when I said that Michaeline Risley was steering the TV adaptations of Sonic? Well, that wasn't her only intention. Risley had come from the movie world, starting her career as an assistant to Kathleen Kennedy when working on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And by 1993, she had started to plant the seeds of bringing Sonic the Hedgehog to the big screen. I was basically driving the Sonic movie. I don't know who came up with the idea, whether it was Tom or Shinobu Toyota or me, or we talked about it as a group. But having come from the movie world, I was always pushing those things. Sega inked a deal with Penn Densham's Trilogy Entertainment and MGM, and began talking with producer Ed Pressman about who would take on the project. Pressman likely came to the project from his connections to Tom Kalinske, as they worked together on the adaptation of Masters of the Universe. However, it was also the failures of Masters of the Universe that put Kalinske on the back foot when it came to turning Sonic into a movie. Released in 1987, when He-Man was in desperate need of a boost of flagging sales, Canon Films' Masters of the Universe was a disaster of a production from start to end. While the madness of working with Canon Films would make a great YouTube video, and there are many, it can be summed up for our purposes with this one anecdote. Canon Films were desperately running out of money to film Masters of the Universe's final climactic scene between He-Man and Skeletor. So desperate, in fact, that one of the founders of Canon even suggested he'd sell his own shoes to get the funds needed. In the end, Mattel agreed to forego half of the rights fee Canon owed them in order to finish the movie. And yet, while all of that was going on, they were promoting a sequel. It's either confidence or arrogance, and the movie tanked, so I'll let you decide. And while it cannot be held 100% responsible for the death of the Masters of the Universe toy line, it certainly didn't help. The movie definitely hurt the brand, but it wasn't just that. Kalinske came from the same school of thought as the president of Mattel, Ray Wagner, during the 1970s. A movie might be a one-hit rush of sales, but a TV show, particularly one that's syndicated, gives you a weekly, sometimes daily, bite of the apple. Wagner famously turned down the option to license Star Wars before the movie came out for that very reason. Kalinske argues, you could get some exposure from a movie, but it wouldn't be the same impact that came from a TV show. So if Sonic is doing well outside of the movie world, why take the risk? But for Risley, when it came to Sonic, the same worry wasn't there. Noting that while several brands have put out failed movies based on their IP, they never hurt 
the overall product. Look at Howard the Duck. It all depends on the timing of the movie, the look of the movie, whether you go live action or animation. MGM brought in Richard Jeffries to write up a treatment for this live action Sonic the Hedgehog movie, even though he only had a couple of horror movie credits to his name. But he'd also worked on several other projects, including the failed big screen adaptation of The Silver Surfer. And it was this sort of work that made him a perfect choice for MGM. They called me, as they often do, because they're looking for a writer to take a project to the next stage of development. In this case, they saw me as an ideal person because of the nature of the project. And the idea to do a movie based on Sonic the Hedgehog could not have come at a better time for Sega. While the company was riding high on the success of the Genesis, they were looking towards their next home console, being developed under the code name Saturn. Production had begun in 1992, and the first version of the system debuted at the Tokyo Toy Show in June of 1994. Along with the Saturn, Sega were also developing a brand new Sonic the Hedgehog game called Sonic Extreme, and Sega wanted the title to be released in conjunction with the movie. They were trying to coordinate the two and make the two compatible. I was being made aware of things I wasn't previously aware of because they tightly controlled the development of the game. And part of breaking the ice with the game crew was to keep that open channel so as the game developed, we could interface this new content into the movie and make them compatible. Jeffrey spent some time at the Sega Technical Institute in San Francisco to meet with Sonic creators, including Yuji Naka, and get to grips with what was being done with the Saturn and Sonic Extreme before heading back to write up his treatment for a live-action Sonic the Hedgehog movie. The treatment, titled Sonic the Hedgehog Wonders of the World, opens with a 12-year-old boy named Josh Pinsky reading out his school paper on a test pilot named Sonic, who was killed in a plane explosion while attempting to break speed barriers. However, his paper is incomplete, and his teacher tells him to finish it by morning or else his parents are going to be called in. Jeffries describes this young hero as an awkward kid at the most awkward age enduring the most awkward time of his life. His parents recently split up, leaving him in joint custody. Josh feels like a ping pong ball, bouncing back and forth between two houses equally ignored by his mum and dad. And the worst thing is, Josh always ends up feeling like the whole rotten mess is his fault. Josh's dad, Hal, is a very smart computer whiz who is currently out of work, recently building an AI computer computer which utilizes a unique system of holographic memory which he's dubbed XRI, Extremely Radical Intelligence. Hal tells his son not to touch the XRI, and of course, he immediately does when his distracted dad is out, asking the XRI to write his paper on the test pilot Sonic. When the XRI doesn't recognize the name, Josh plugs in a Sonic the Hedgehog game into his Sega Saturn to demonstrate. That's when odd things begin to happen. Sonic stops responding to the game controller and discovers a will of his own. As Richard Jeffries describes it, these kids work out some hack, where Sonic the Hedgehog steps through the right door and into the real world, so he becomes a renegade from the game world. Sonic and Josh stand face to face, two friends meeting for the first time, described in the treatment as a 3D CGI guy in the real world. Jeffries says in reference to the 3D animation in a live action film, there wasn't a lot of this at the time but I checked with my friend in the visual effects industry and we figured out a way to make it more practical. At the time it was becoming more practical to make CG characters into the real world. Instantly Sonic's curiosity gets out of control and the apartment is quickly torn apart. Amidst all the chaos Dr. Robotnik also escapes from the game and howls with delight. He's waited years to break out of the game world. He sprints his spaceship, blasts out of the apartment, and escapes with demented enthusiasm into the real world. The boss also works out how to get through the glitch, and he would wreak havoc with his henchmen and CG characters. Sonic tries to track down Robotnik, but gets distracted and confused by the real world. When he jumps onto rooftops, the chimneys crack. When he tries to impress a girl, she screams in terror. The real world isn't ready for a blue hedgehog walking down the street. And the the longer he spends in the real world, the weaker he's becoming. Hal returns home to find his apartment destroyed and the XRI broken. Josh lies saying it was burglars and once again mum and dad are fighting with Josh in the middle. During the night, Sonic tracks Josh down. He's weakened and exhausted. He needs to get his energy back and to do that, he needs Chaos Emeralds. Josh and Sonic discover that Chaos Emeralds actually exist in the real world, encased in ordinary looking rocks. You just have to know which ones to crack open. They go hunting and find their first Chaos Emeralds. Sonic recovers his strength, but Josh 
wants to try some for himself, which he uses to write his whole paper in 30 seconds. When Josh asks for more, Sonic warns him not to use the power until he can master it. Robotnik has taken over an abandoned amusement park and plots to use the power of the Chaos Emeralds to control the real world. He recruits a group of school bullies and gives them cyber body parts to turn them into bully bots who start digging underneath the amusement park, smashing every rock to find that one in a million Chaos Emerald. In the second act of the story, Hal has a new job, only it's with Shady Corporation, who are reopening Botnik Land Amusement Park. Kids can enter, go on the ride, and eat candy and ice cream for free! So every kid in town is lining up for a ticket. Sonic and Josh snoop into the park to discover that Robotnik is using the ride and Hal's XRI technology to replace all of the kids with Kinderbot Robo Clones. The real kids are put to work digging under the town, cracking rocks, finding the one in a million Chaos Emerald. The perfect angel of Kinderbot clones go home with the parents. Robotnik's plan, they learn, is to use the Chaos Emerald and the power of the XRI to digitize the natural wonders of the world like the Amazon rainforest at Mount Everest, which he will then recreate in virtual reality so he can charge big money for the world to come and see. Which, if you look at this from a different angle, is kind of a sweet motive for a villain. Sonic and Josh are dumbfounded. They must stop this evil plan. Josh is scared, but Sonic tells him that he has to stand up for what you believe in and give it everything you've got. There's a chase scene between Sonic, Josh, and the bully bots. Sonic is captured, and Josh tries to tell Hal and Lisa the truth about Robotnik, the Kinderbots, and the XRI, and Sonic, and they, of course, don't believe him. Across town, the Kinderbots return home. Clone kids who do everything their parents ask, eat peas, clean room, do homework. Josh is horrified by the Kinderbot kids. He knows they are Robotnik's evil creation. He fears what a terrible world it would be if Robotnik mechanizes everything. In the third act, inspired by Sonic's speech, Josh hatches a plan to get Robotnik back into the game world. As Richard Jeffries describes it, the plan was for Sonic to go to be the bait, and they were going to lure the boss back into the game. Game world. But what happens is they do that, but the kids get sucked into the game world for Act 3 of our story. There's a showdown between Sonic, Josh, and Robotnik, and the good guys win in the end, and Robotnik gets away to no doubt come up with a new plan to take over the world in the sequel. The treatment then reads, Hal, Lisa, and Josh step through the vortex, but there's a sad moment when Sonic decides he must stay behind in the game world. He needs to be vigilant against Dr. Robotnik and his nefarious ways. After all, that's his job. The adventure brings Josh, Hal, and Lisa closer together, but Hal decides that the XRI is too dangerous to ever use again and asks Josh to put it away for safekeeping. Josh promises not to use it again, but notices on a TV screen nearby, Sonic winks at him, then goes about his gameplay business. Jeffries describes it as a big parting moment where they go their separate ways. Apart from you leave that little back door in there, for a sequel. According to Jeffries, feedback to Sonic the Hedgehog Wonders of the World was very positive. They loved it. Even the game people loved it. It was all looking good for Sonic the Hedgehog Wonders of the World. But the game people, as Jeffries puts it, were having major issues with the development of the exact video game that the film was supposed to tie into. Enter Sonic Extreme. <laughs> Sonic Extreme went through various different iterations before it eventually landed on that title. It was also intended for multiple different systems under multiple different titles, like Sonic 16 for the Genesis and Sonic Mars for the 32X add-on, and eventually they settled on Sonic Extreme for the Sega Saturn as the main thrust of the campaign. Unfortunately, it didn't quite go to plan. The game would have introduced new characters like Tiara Bubowski, a playable female character in traditional 2D levels, along with other new gameplay modes like Tails' first-person flight levels, top-down action-based levels for Knuckles, and a fish-eye perspective for Sonic's levels. Sounds amazing, but on reflection, it was perhaps a little ambitious. The development team was split into two. Chris Sen and Offa Allon would tackle the regular levels, while Chris Coffin designed the boss stages, themselves being another different playstyle, which would become known as the boss engine. But problems arose when Sen and Allon tried to transfer their data from PCs to the Saturn hardware, notoriously difficult to program for. The game was only running at four frames a second with only four colors on screen. Not exactly supersonic speed. So a new development studio called Point of View was brought in to help, but 
they also struggled to port what Senna and Allen had made onto the Sega Saturn. In fact, it was only Chris Coffin's boss engine designs that worked, and Sega Japan was so impressed with what he'd done that his designs became the only mode for the game. Points of view were removed from the project, and it was now up to Coffin, Senna and Allen to finish what they'd started. Sega of America granted the team access to use the code engine used on Yuji Naka's Nights nice Into Dreams project and found it so much easier to work with. The Sonic game began to come to life, but what they didn't realize was that Sega of America did not ask Naka's permission first, and when he found out, he had the production halted, threatening to quit Sega altogether if it was used again. And all of this was happening just nine months before the game was supposed to be released for the Christmas 1996 market, which, in computer programming terms, really isn't long enough. Sega wanted a big title to compete against Nintendo Super Mario 64, so the pressure was mounting. Unbelievably, Sen and Coffin moved out of their apartments to live permanently at Sega's offices to get the game finished working 24 hours a day on it. Obviously, this had disastrous consequences. Coffin came down with a bad case of pneumonia and, at the behest of his doctor, left the project, swiftly followed by Chris Sen. Sega missed the Christmas 1996 deadline for Sonic Extreme. Instead, the Saturn got a port of the Genesis game Sonic 3D, which did little to help the sales of the console over the holiday period. Sonic Extreme was officially cancelled in August of 1997, and outside of leaked footage from various prototypes, its only physical legacy is in the conclusion of an animated tie-in cartoon originally titled an extremely Sonic Christmas, but renamed to Sonic Christmas Blast to tie in with the port of Sonic 3D. An extremely Merry Christmas. With the release schedule for the game up the spout, this also meant that the movie would not tie into the game's release either. But there were other issues with Wonders of the World. Richard Jeffrey says that he didn't receive any notes for his draft, but there is an internal note from Shinobu Toyoda who felt that the script needed a big change. Replace Robotnik as the lead villain, feeling that gamers wanted something new other than the Sonic vs Robotnik fight that they'd already seen in the games. This was something that Risley just did not agree with. I don't know why he'd say that. Robotnik is a great villain in the animated series and in the game, but for Jeffries, this was not an issue at all. They were probably trying to develop a new bad guy for the game, and so they wanted to move beyond Robotnik, and they wanted the movie to reflect the future of the game, which is fine with me. A bad guy is a bad guy. Whatever the new motivation of the bad guy is, I'm sure there are ways to make that fun in the movie. That was like changing a character's name as far as I was concerned. On top of that, despite liking the pitch that had been presented, Sega were nervous about how big this movie might be and what costs might come with that. Risley had seen firsthand just how difficult it was to make Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and these nerves didn't breed confidence in the minds of Sega of Japan. And speaking of Japan, there was a sticking point for Densham's trilogy involvement, however, which was the Yuji Naka, creator of the original Sonic the Hedgehog game, wanted to include their origin story for the Sonic character, which was not used as part of the lore outside of Japan. That origin story sees that Sonic is the reincarnation of sorts of a test pilot named Henry Gordon, who died in a plane explosion while trying to break the sound barrier. His nickname was Hedgehog due to his sharp technique and had a blue hedgehog embroidered onto his flight jacket. When he became the first man to achieve super speed, his friend Chuck Yeager renamed the design Sonic the Hedgehog, and when Henry's daughter Meg is caught in the aftermath of a plane explosion herself, a real-life version of the design of her dad's jacket saves her and she wakes up in a hospital bed to find that Sonic is no longer adorned on the jacket. And some of that backstory can be seen at the start of The Wonders of the World, but it's unknown how much of it would have tied into the rest of the script. In the end, Densham and Trilogy refunded all of their developmental fees, feeling that the project was not going to get past this. Sega wanted to hold on to the original developer's origin story, which I could not see working in a film structure, and they didn't want to insult the game developer by letting us work out a more feature-friendly approach. 
Following the pitch being delivered, MGM pulled out of their deal with Sega due to not being able to agree on a corporate level that would work for both parties. But Sega allowed Jeffries to shop his Sonic the Hedgehog pitch to other studios. Jeffries took it to DreamWorks, and although it got a glowing endorsement from Terry Rossio's daughter, Sega were asking too much for the Sonic character, which wasn't what DreamWorks were looking for at that point in time. They want a low-priced intellectual property that people have forgotten about that they can breathe new life into. I figured that if it didn't work at DreamWorks, that was the best shot we got. And with that, just like Sonic Extreme, Sonic the Hedgehog Wonders of the World was dead. When asked why the movie didn't get made, Michaeline Risley simply responds, I think it was Japan. The small team behind the Sonic games weren't keen either, but ultimately, I think it was Japan that killed this. There certainly feels like there were a lot of factors working against the live-action Sonic movie. Saturn sales struggled following the rush launch by Sega of Japan, not held by Sony's PlayStation being released at a much lower price point. <laughs> And it never had that killer app that made people pick up the console like Sonic the Hedgehog did for the Genesis. Tom Kalinske laments, I had my problems with the Saturn, and that's outside of the issues I had with its hardware. We released the Saturn in June when I wanted to release it in the fall, and even then, I thought that was too early. I wanted to wait until June of the following year so we could ensure that we had that killer software at launch. If we had some good software, or if we had a killer Sonic game like Sonic Extreme, the Saturn may have done better. A lack of Sonic Extreme was one thing, but there were also corporate issues. My feeling at the time, and I could be wrong about this, but movies fall apart between Hollywood and the game world because each party feels like they should have 75% of the deal, just on financial terms. Michaeline Risley left Sega in 1995, and without the driving force behind the movie and the entertainment side of the Sonic character, there wasn't anyone pushing for Sonic to branch outside of the comfortable video game walls. In the ashes of Sonic Extreme, Sega were instead building Sonic Adventure for the Dreamcast. But by the end of 1995 going into 1996, was there really an appetite for a Sonic movie? Knuckles and Chaotix didn't set the world on fire because it was released on the already failing 32X and both cartoons were off TV, so there hadn't been any new big Sonic title since Sonic and Knuckles. While there was still the Archie comic series, it wouldn't have been enough to push an entire movie. If anything, a Sonic movie in 1996, especially without a game to back it up, would have been akin to releasing a Masters of the Universe movie in 1987. Maybe they were hoping a movie could reinvigorate that, but maybe it was response to where Sonic was headed, and maybe MGM came to that conclusion. I don't know. Maybe they thought that the character was flagging and didn't want to spend $150 million on a movie with animation that will take longer. Where would Sonic be as an IP by the time the film is released? That's just pure speculation on my part. But it all comes back to that idea of fear. Fear that doing a Sonic movie might have hurt the Sonic video game brand. Kalinske had been burnt in the past with Masters of the Universe and wouldn't pull the trigger on a Barbie movie for fear that a bad reputation around the actor in that role could damage that brand. Just a few years prior, Super Mario Brothers and Street Fighter had bad outings that were roundly criticized in the movie world, of course, causing Nintendo and Capcom to tighten their grip on other IPs for fear of damaging other brands. With Sonic's popularity already low by 1996, yeah, why take the risk? In his own words, Kalinske believes that the Sonic brand was strong enough to probably withstand it, but there is that fear. And that is what this all came down to. Fear. And really, that's why Sonic didn't hit the big screen in 1996, which translates as a bunch of corporations not willing to risk their collection of brands in case something bad happened to them. Which is just... Oh, actually, Laurie. Laurie, sorry. Um, you've got a coffee cup just resting on my copy of Sonic 2. Could you, could you, could you take that off? Can you just, 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 just next to it, it'll be fine. Just next to it, just, I'll, I'll do it, I'll, 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 I'll move it, it's okay, I'll, I'll come move it. It's absolutely fine. Absolutely, it's absolutely fine. It's getting... Oh, sorry, what was I talking about? 